Hi. Hey folks, my name is Emily Weber. I'm a machine learning specialist solutions architect at Amazon Web Services. And today uh, we are gonna learn how to pre-train foundation models on AWS, my friends. Yes, that's right. Uh, in this session, you're gonna learn just the first couple steps about how to create your own foundation models on AWS. So you can imagine, obviously this is a complex topic. Uh, so this is the start of our level 400. In this class, the first couple of YouTube videos were uh, at a level 300, arguably 200, maybe in the first ones. Uh, and that was to get you introduced to some of the easier topics, some of the higher level, more, you know, um, uh, more simple topics that are related to uh, some of the larger trends. Uh, and right now we're gonna super dive deep. <laughs> we're gonna learn about pre-training foundation models. Um, and in this class, we're mostly gonna learn about how to pre-train foundation models uh, on AWS using SageMaker, and we're gonna learn about distributed training on SageMaker. And then in the next YouTube video, uh, we are gonna learn how to prepare data sets and then how to literally train at scale. So this one introduces you to the concept of uh, pre-training foundation models, experimental results for what you need before you uh, uh, pull the trigger and uh, go crazy with all your accelerators. Um, and then in the next one, we'll learn about, again, preparing data at scale and then actually executing large training runs on SageMaker. So let's dive in. All right, uh, so in the session right now, uh, we are going to learn when uh, you should pre-train a new foundation model. So remember, pre-training is how to literally create the foundation model from scratch. So not just fine tuning the thing, um, but actually pre-training a new foundation model from scratch. Uh, and so we're gonna learn when uh, to do this. Um, so when it's actually a good idea and then uh, what you need to do to do it effectively, uh, how to do it on AWS, and then again, the distributed training fundamentals. And we're gonna close out with a notebook walkthrough of pre-training a 30 billion parameter LLM on SageMaker. So let's go. All right. So we've covered a lot in this class so far. And in particular, before you actually approach creating a new foundation model, I want you to have closed these four things. <laughs> so four items I want you to do. So first, you should have tested many different foundation models. So you should have tried a few foundation models and you should have done prompt engineering with those foundation models. Um, so you should have learned about instruction tuning, um, you should have put instructions in your prompts, you should have tried few shot prompting, and you should have gotten some results with this. You should feel pretty comfortable with prompt engineering. Second thing I need you to do is I want you have to have tried a variety of fine tuning techniques. So you should have already done PEFT. You should have already done a larger, more classic fine tuning. Maybe you even did uh, the continued unsupervised pre-training on a couple tens of GBs, um, but definitely you want experience with fine tuning. You should have exposed those both models to your end consumers and gotten feedback on their performance. So uh, you want your customers to have looked at the uh, result, results that came out of the prompt engineering and to have looked at the results that came out of the fine tuning. And you should have not just anecdotal or qualitative evidence, you want empirical <laughs> like numbers that you can nail down like, yes, okay, customers respond well to this. They don't respond well to that. Um, you know, the, this model response is more accurate. That model is, is better suited to different use cases. You wanna be able to, to lock this down. Uh, that is because basically you're gonna use this baseline as the justification for your pre-training pre project. Let's explain how to do that. So really, if you're actually considering a pre-training project, if you're serious about thinking, hey, maybe I want to create a new foundation model, here's what you need. So basically I want you to build a chart like this. I want you to say, okay, on my y-axis, here's my model accuracy, right from zero to 100, or another KPI, right? It doesn't have to be accuracy, but you want some indicator of the quality of your model results. And then I want you to show me all of the different types of uh, techniques that you tried. So you wanna be able to say, okay, so zero shot got me here maybe got me to 10%. 
Uh, single shot maybe got me to 15. Few shot prompting got me maybe to 20. Parameter efficient fine tuning got me to 25. Classic fine tuning got me to maybe 30. And then this area north of this, like the place you're gonna grow, uh, we are pretty sure, we hope pre-training will fill this gap. And I say hope because pre-training is a big project. <laughs> you're, you're gonna run a lot of GPUs and a lot of accelerators. And before I sign off on your project, I want you to show me um, that you have reason to believe that it's going to improve your model and not just, um, you know, oh, I heard someone else do it, but like empirically, uh, here's what happens. So what, what does it actually take? You know, you come in and you say, Emily, you know, I'm interested in pre-training a new foundation model because I'm ambitious and I have data sets and I think it's fun. Uh, what does it take? What, what, what do I need? Uh, so let's look at three different foundation models um, that were actually all trained on SageMaker, happily all trained on AWS. Um, and let's explore uh, what it took to pre-train those. Now, all of the uh, data that I'm sharing here is from the papers uh, that were released with all of these models. So let's, let's take a look at this. Uh, so Stable Diffusion, we know Stable Diffusion, 2.1, 5 billion images. Uh, so that's a lot, right? That's, that's a massive, uh, that's a massive data set. And when you unzip that, uh, it turns out to be 240 terabytes. Now, again, this is from the Lion data set. And so that's basically crawled from the internet. Uh, and then you can download it based on the licensing of those images. But so that's a lot of data, right? That's multiple hundreds of terabytes. Um, but interestingly, uh, the model size of Stable Diffusion, again, is quite small. It actually fits on a single accelerator. Uh, so you're looking at less than 1 billion parameters in the neural network of that model, right? And that's actually the self-attention blocks um, and the multi-head attention blocks um, that are constituting the uh, body of the neural network. So the encoders and the decoders. Um, and in the case of Stable Diffusion, actually, it's, it's not even just one model. It's actually four different models that are operating together to train this unit, um, where the unit is taking in the text um, as uh, rendered through an LLM for embeddings. Um, and then it's uh, responding with the image that it's generating. So it's generating this image on the other side of the unit. And then again, it's taking steps um, in diffusion. And, and so it's actually generating this image, it's iteratively generating images, um, and then it's using this denoising process um, to compare the image that it generated randomly uh, with the ground truth image because it's a labeled data set for starters. And then this uh, updates the unit to then train a better generative model. So that's a long way of saying that it's a small model. And so because it's a small model, um, it fits on fewer instances. So as Stability reports, um, when they trained Stable Diffusion 2.1, they used a cluster size of 37 P4D instances. Now remember the P4D instance uh, is an AWS instance family. You're looking at eight uh, NVIDIA uh, A100 GPUs, um, the P4D version, each of them has 40 GB of memory. Um, they're backed with uh, NVMe local storage. Um, you're looking at RDMA inter-GPU connect um, and uh, lots of other fun things. And so the, again, the cluster size is 37 P4D instances. So times eight um, to give you all of the GPUs that are in this cluster size, all of the accelerators. And then this entire job uh, took 28 days to train, which if you think about how long it would take a person to look at 5 billion images, <laughs> 28 days is actually not that bad, right? Relative to the amount of data this thing is crunching through. So that's 28 days. And then Falcon um, is a new LLM um, that came in uh, just in the last month, the last couple months, um, from the TII Institute in uh, Abu Dhabi, um, and they built this incredible model. Um, and in the 40 billion um, parameter model size, uh, they used one trillion tokens. 
Uh, and so this is using the, the updated scaling, scaling laws from the Chinchilla paper uh, that indicates that LLMs are mostly undertrained, actually, and so they recommend significantly increasing the data set size, um, which means the model uh, at a smaller level is actually going to have more information. And so that actually is lower pressure, that's pressure to decrease the size of the models. So in any case, um, so they trained Falcon on one trillion tokens. If you average it out, uh, that's just under three terabytes, which some of you are sitting out there thinking, hey, that's a lot. And other of you are thinking that's pretty accessible. <laughs> like for, for what people do on AWS, uh, like three terabytes is actually not that big of a deal. <laughs> you, can, you can do a lot of, um, you can pretty easily uh, build and manage uh, systems on AWS for, uh, for three terabytes. That's actually not that much data, um, speaking from a cloud perspective. So yeah, so that's all it is, um, not that bad. And then you're looking at 40 billion parameters in the model size and the neural network itself. Uh, and then the cluster they used was 48 P4D instances. So again, on SageMaker, same instance type, 40 GB of memory um, in those V100s, and then they just have 48. So in that SageMaker training job, they just set number of instances equals 48. Beautiful thing. And then this took two months to train. Uh, and so you'll notice that they report two months and not 60 days precisely. So we can assume that there's some start and stop uh, in the in the two month report, but just about two months. Uh, and then the last model here is uh, Bloomberg GPT. Bloomberg GPT is another wonderful case study, obviously from Bloomberg. Um, and as they report, this, uh, this model was trained on SageMaker. And Bloomberg GPT is really interesting because they built a large language model for financial services. Um, so they noticed that uh, most NLP models were sort of general purpose for the general domain, and they wanted to build an LLM that was exclusively for financial services. Uh, and so they uh, leveraged 700 billion tokens. And as you can read in the paper, uh, they split it between, so half of their data set uh, was from uh, the common crawl or, or the internet, basically. The common crawl is a well understood data set that's used to create uh, foundation models for language. And so half of their data set is from the common crawl. Um, and then the second half of their data set was Bloomberg specific um, financial services, like I think articles, headlines, um, the Bloomberg news. Uh, so half of it was their own proprietary Bloomberg um, financial services data set. And so they had this nice mix of the two. And then they went for a 50 billion parameter model, again, following the, the chinchilla scaling laws. Uh, and snuck in just under two terabytes. So just under two terabytes uh, for their data set size. And they had a quite aggressive on the cluster size. So that's 64 P4D instances, um, which is a natural step up um, from the, the Falcon proposed 4DB. Uh, and then the Bloomberg GPT, again, just under two months, so about 53 days uh, to train the model again, on SageMaker. Uh, and so this should give you a nice summary of what it takes to pre-train a new foundation model or to create a new foundation model from scratch. In summary, it takes three things. Um, it takes data in terabytes, uh, fortunately not in petabytes. Um, so you're looking at a few terabytes, like one, two, or three, um, and then uh, you're looking at tens of compute nodes. So you're going to want, um, obviously, accelerators, quite a few of them. <laughs> you want a lot of accelerators. Uh, and you want tens of compute nodes. So you don't really need to go north of 100 compute nodes. Uh, you certainly can. Um, and obviously, if you are training a model that's much larger uh, than the 40 or 50 billion parameter. And if you're training a model that's north of 100 billion parameters, uh, then certainly you might, uh, you might pop into more than 100 compute nodes. Um, but more than anything, again, I want you to have a super strong business case. Like I want you to be able to say, like Emily, if we take this foundation model and we put it here, 
our business is going to go up. <laughs> like when you can tell that to me really concretely, I'm gonna be so excited and I'm gonna say like, let's go, <laughs> let's get started on your pre-training project. Because if you have these three things, then you have what it takes to create your own foundation model. That saves you from uh, legal potential risk um, that makes the data licensing and data usage a lot more clear. And it also makes the rest of your application development extremely clear because then you're not locked in to, to any vendor. You can create your own foundation model and then put it wherever you want to. So there's a lot of uh, flexibility in this approach. Um, and so that's why it, it's, it's my personal favorite. All right, and so again, before you actually hit go on, on all of those, those hundreds and thousands of accelerators, uh, I want you to be able to have this like last final chart, basically where you want to prove empirically that as a result of your experiments, uh, you saw that using a pre-trained model improved the performance, specifically the model accuracy or another statistic that you're tracking as a KPI, that using a pre-trained model like improved the performance of your open source model and this will do X to your business case. <laughs> and, and once you have all of those cleanly defined, uh, then you are ready uh, to, to hit go on your pre-training project. Now remember that both of these are actually fine-tuned. So you would take an open source BERT, um, or you would take maybe open source Falcon if you want to, uh, the base Falcon, and then you'd fine tune it on your data. So maybe you're fine tuning uh, base Falcon on your 30 GB of data uh, for, your, for your prompts, your instruction fine tuning that you want to do. Um, or you're doing uh, one step of, of uh, unsupervised pre-training. So you do one round of unsupervised pre-training and then do the fine tuning. But in any case, what I'm saying is the accuracy of both of these is on your downstream task. And you wanna say that compared to this open source model or possibly a proprietary model, um, we, we are able to show that pre-training on our data uh, actually improved the accuracy of our model. And so once you've done this, uh, then you are well on your way to a really cool and a really successful uh, pre-training project. So how do we do this? Literally, how do we pre-train or create our own foundation models on AWS? Uh, it's actually not that bad. You might think it's terrifying. It's not, it's doable. Uh, we've been helping customers, as you can see, do this for a long time. We have an awesome orchestration stack. We have a lot of expertise built up in this area. Uh, and so it's, it's not too bad. So the first thing you're gonna do, again, is just gather your data sets, store these, um, have these ready to go. Many different ways of doing that, which we'll learn about actually in the next, uh, the next class. So first you're gonna gather your data and park that probably in an S3 bucket. Uh, then you're gonna process your data for training. As we learn in the next lecture, many different ways of doing that on AWS. Um, my personal favorite is SageMaker, so we'll tend to go the SageMaker route, but there's a lot of other ways you can do this. Uh, then um, we're gonna basically optimize the data storage for our, for our training runs. Um, so I enjoy using FSx for Luster. Um, so we'll actually create an FSx for Luster volume, which we can then mount to our training instances uh, for really rapid iteration. So we'll optimize our data storage for the runs, uh, and then we'll run a notebook somewhere uh, to do develop and test uh, basically training scripts. So if you're in the cloud, you'll use small like CPU, maybe small uh, older GPUs just to develop and test your training scripts, uh, or you can just run this locally on your laptop, really up to you. And so you'll develop and test these training scripts, right? So that are um, pointing to the Falcon, for example, model config, um, loading the model config, uh, doing some testing there with the PyTorch forward and backward pass. Um, alternatively, maybe you're just using the Hugging Face Trainer API um, and maybe you're building it into a distributed training framework. So you're using Accelerate um, or you're using DeepSpeed or using SageMaker distributed training libraries that we'll learn about here. And so again, um, you're gonna start really small here. So you're gonna start with uh, small CPUs, 
small GPUs, older GPUs, small models, small data sets, and then incrementally you're gonna scale this up. So over the course of maybe three, four, five months, um, you'll take a number of scaling jumps. So you'll start on just a notebook, just running the basic model config on a uh, hundred samples from your data set or something like this. And then you'll increase that. Then you'll, you'll broaden the scope, um, maybe using a larger GPU, larger instances, larger volumes of data. Uh, and then you'll take another jump. Then you go to distributed training. So you're using multiple hosts. Uh, and then on and on until you're ready to go for one like massive run. Um, and then throughout that, you, you evaluate the model artifacts. So after each training run, you're gonna download the model checkpoints um, and poke at it, like load it into a framework, um, see how well it does in PyTorch locally or with Hugging Face, um, and just compare the performance, right? And, and just test it. And then that uh, leads you back into to the rest of your flow. So what does this look like in action? Again, I like to think of, of a pre-training project as having different phases. Actually, I talk about this in my book. Uh, you, you can definitely look straight in my book, uh, Pre-trained Vision and Large Language Models, to, to check this out. Um, but yeah, so I, I think about this in, in a number of phases. So really your first phase is uh, a 1% sample of your data. And I say this heuristically, like just use a little bit um, use a little data, use the small size, the smallest size of the model, um, and run on a single accelerator, so just one GPU, uh, and that should not take more than an hour. Like, that should be one fast little mini job that you run. Um, development time on that, I would count that in hours. Again, you're using managed services. Um, you're mostly stepping through notebooks that are already built, uh, and so the development time for that shouldn't be massive. Um, and then you're gonna increase the data set, right? So then phase two is a bump. So you'll use more of the data set. You'll marry that with a larger model size, increase the number of accelerators. So instead of just using one Tranium chip, now you're using eight Tranium chips. Um, and then your development and compute time that's gonna take you a couple of days. Like that's that's more complex. Um, and so it'll take you a couple of days to, to build this out, uh, to develop it, test it, make sure it's running appropriately, optimize a couple things, troubleshoot it, submit a ticket, read a blog post, all the normal things. Um, yeah, and so that, that's phase two is like, can I actually use data parallel, which we'll learn about in a minute, can I use data parallel to park my model on all eight of these accelerators and then run my forward and backward pass? Once you've closed phase two, then things start to get interesting. So then you're looking at a much larger sample of your data. And depending on how large you want to go, you could just go full throttle, right? You could just go straight for the, straight for the full data sample. Um, or you could go with just the 50% use a larger model, and then maybe you're running on multiple uh, boxes, actually. So maybe you have, uh, yeah, eight, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, eight instances. Is that eight? No, that'd be two. <laughs> 16 divided by eight is two. So you've got two instances, um, two instances with each having eight accelerators. So you have two instances, um, and it'll take you a little bit. Honestly, two instances probably won't take you a couple of weeks. That'll probably take you a week and a half. Um, but so you have two boxes now instead of just one uh, and you're using a larger data sample um, and you're using a larger version of your model and now you know concretely that you're developing on two instances whereas before you were just developing on one. So the jump here in accelerators, like you see first we were running on a single GPU or a single training chip, then we increase that out to eight GPUs, eight Tranium chips all sitting in a single box. So now we just have one instance with all eight of those. Then we double that. So then in this phase three, we have two boxes. Now we have two uh, P4D instances or two Tranium boxes. Uh, and we are um, essentially training on a larger version of our model. And we're doing this for a larger period of time. 
Uh, and then finally we'll we'll go crazy, right? And then we'll we'll hit the trigger for the whole thing um, and max out our data set size. So we're running on the entire data sample. Um, we're using the largest model that we can. We're maxing out our accelerator runs. Uh, so maybe we're going up to 64 instances. Uh, if we wanna train a fully generative model, maybe we're training 100 billion parameters, maybe more. Or if we're just doing classification, you know, or like small targeted generation, maybe we're only doing that 40 or 50 billion range. Uh, but so in any case, uh, at each phase, again, we're gonna download that model checkpoint and we're gonna test it to make sure that it's valid. Uh, so we'll just download the model checkpoint, uh, load it into our uh, hugging face uh, framework, uh, run some local development on that and, and make sure we like it. So when you think about your project in these phases, it makes it much easier to uh, mitigate the risks, right? And mitigate the, the complexity and the frustration and the stress, uh, because then you can just easily focus on each of the solvable steps. Uh, and then by the end of it, you've, you've got an awesome model. And so uh, we come to find out that there's this thing called distributed training, right? And as, as you may have guessed, um, in order to train a model on hundreds or thousands of accelerators, uh, you need a framework to actually distribute this, right? To manage all of the copies of the model uh, and then to synchronize the copies of those model across the forward and the backward paths that the neural network is taking. And we're gonna learn how to do that. Um, but before we even distribute uh, in a model, there's something I like to talk about, which is called job parallelism. And so this is actually really common on SageMaker um, because we have this elastic training API. We have this ephemeral training API uh, where you can invoke SageMaker and say, just SageMaker, create this training job. We'll spin up instances, we'll copy your data from your data location, copy in your image, uh, invoke your image, stream everything to CloudWatch, and then pop your model in S3 when it's done. So we create a cluster on demand. We actually spin up CPU or accelerator-based instances on demand, uh, interact with your data, and by that I mean mount it uh, on the training volume for you, on the training instance, uh, and give you this really nice managed training experience. It's elastic um, because you don't need to literally provision all of the boxes ahead of time. Um, you're just calling them when you need them, like precisely to, to train the model. So job parallelism is handy when you need to train multiple models. I like to use it when I'm processing data. Honestly, I'm so used to the SageMaker training API in the SageMaker way. I just use it for all of my data processing because it's very efficient for me to do so. Um, so I'll actually show you how to do data processing in SageMaker um, just on CPUs. Um, so we'll, we'll take a look at that uh, here and then in the next video as well. So job parallelism is the first kind of distributed training we'll learn about. So job parallelism refers to literally running multiple jobs at the same time, um, but using different inputs and outputs. So in this case, I'm running three separate jobs, right? I have my S3 bucket where all my data is stored and then I'm running these different jobs and each of these is using um, the same image. They could be using different images. They can be using different scripts. Um, and then all of them are the metadata is captured in the SageMaker control plane. Uh, the logs are sent to CloudWatch. Uh, and then my model artifact is stored in S3 after the end of the job. Now I like job parallelism because it lets me scale up to as many models as I need to train. So for example, I might write a really basic like Python loop where I'm just gonna list through all of my models or all of my jobs that I need to run for each job. I'll point to my input location, so some S3 path. Uh, I'll set an output location, also in S3. Uh, and then I'll get the estimators. Remember the estimator is this uh, syntax, this uh, Python syntax that we have that is a wrapper around the training job API. So it lets you call the training job API, but just in Python. And so you'll get the estimator. Um, and then from this, you'll set your estimator and you'll call model.fit. 
right? So estimator.fit, you fit this model in Python, and then with this handy parameter here, weight equal false, um, what that means is it, it frees Jupyter. So when you use the default settings, Jupyter will sort of sit there with, and it'll show a little process running. Um, and so that will halt your notebook um, or halt your uh, Python process because it thinks that there's a variable that's running or that there's a, there's a process that's running. And so in this case, um, when you set weight equal to false, basically uh, that saves you from that. Like that completes the local Python process so it completes the local Python execution after it's called the API. So then your local Python uh, executor stops, it halts, it exits, um, but in the back end, you've actually turned on these SageMaker instances. So you're turning on the SageMaker training instance, you've got this cluster that's now running, um, and then this is how you can literally loop through it, right? So you loop through your list of models and then for each of these, you create this estimator, you call estimator.fit, and then when my weight is set to false, again, that just runs the jobs. And so this way, I can have basically three jobs that I'm invoking almost nearly at the same time. Like if you're doing a lot of data processing here, then obviously it won't run at the same time, but if you're not doing it in data processing, then these jobs will basically execute at nearly the same second, because uh, it's a pretty fast loop. So this is how you can do job parallelism uh, using the SageMaker training API. You can use this to train models uh, or you can use this to process data. Um, another handy feature to use here is called warm pools. Uh, and so warm pools is another parameter you add to the estimator and it keeps the instance warm actually. So when you run a job, um, the instance turns on and then let's say I forgot a parentheses or I, typed in like one letter that was wrong and my Python script breaks, what do I do? Uh, so when warm pools are enabled, um, the instance will stay there. So you can just do a one line code update, uh, run the training job again, and it will start in seconds uh, instead of needing to wait up to eight minutes to, to restart. So warm pools are great. Uh, and you can use those to, to you can use this here um, if you're looping through so like lots of models um, and you wanna reuse those instances. So job parallelism is the first kind of distributed training I'd like you to think about. Uh, and then the second kind uh, is called data parallelism. So let's try and understand data parallelism. So distributed gradient descent has evolved over time. So let, let's unpack this. So gradient descent, remember, is the core a uh, mathematical operation that inspires all of the optimizers in neural networks. So neural network optimization um, is how the neural network learns, right? You, you define your layers in neural networks, you pass data through those layers, be that images, be that text, um, they get all of this math computed on them, um, and then at the end of the layer, there's this output, and that can be generation, it can be classification, it's whatever you define it. Um, and then there's a comparison with the output of the neural network and the ground truth. And the ground truth can be created uh, artificially through pre-training, which if you want to know more about, read my book on pre-training. Um, but so yeah, so it, it, it creates it through this unsupervised pre-training loss uh, that essentially is defined through masking. And so that's how it's created in language um, and then in vision, if you're doing stable diffusion, remember you have captions. So the training data set for uh, stable diffusion is labeled. In any case, they're all using gradient descent. Uh, gradient descent is an algorithm, uh, is a, again, a mathematical operation that you learned in your first calculus class, believe it or not, uh, when you were solving derivatives, um, because gradient actually refers to derivative, right? There, there, there are two ways of describing the same topic. Um, and so when you're descending through the gradient, um, you're computing the partial derivatives. And so we compute the partial derivatives of your neural network uh, with respect to your loss function, um, because we want to know how those parameters are impacting the loss. And then to minimize the loss, 
we update the neural network parameters in the other direction. So anyway, that's how neural networks learn. And it's easier if it's all just on one box, right? If everything is just on one GPU or one instance, one accelerator, it's a lot easier. Uh, once you distribute this and once you need to run this, not just on multiple GPUs or multiple accelerators, but multiple hosts and multiple instances, it's a lot more challenging. So one of the classic ways of doing this is called the parameter server. So a parameter server literally maintains one copy of the model. It's one sort of global copy of the model that's also interacting with all of these hosts, all of these worker hosts. And so this sort of leader rank here um, will keep track of all of the other instances in the cluster um, and will keep track of the gradients that are being computed. So the forward and backward pass. Um, and so this worker, this master node, this leader node uh, will send the data out to all of these workers. Um, they compute the forward and the backward pass. Um, they send, they compute the forward pass rather um, because they're all using copies of the data. They send the forward pass back into the central one. This averages that and then sends it back out to update um, the parameters with the backward pass. So uh, parameter servers um, are somewhat slow. They're not the fastest thing in the world because when you have all of these uh, accelerators and all of these hosts that are attacking just one spot, it leads to conflicts um, and it slows down communication. And so, yeah, so parameter servers are a little bit slow, um, but surprisingly, they're somewhat bandwidth. Uh, they're somewhat low bandwidth. Um, the, the communication hops are not massive. This is compared with uh, the MPI all reduce uh, algorithm, algorithm that is common in high performance computing, um, where you see all of the nodes are actually communicating with each other. Uh, so instead of having one centralized leader, as in the parameter server, um, in this approach, you see all of the nodes, again, communicating with each other like a ring. So that's, so this is called a ring-based topology um, because the nodes, again, create this, this ring uh, where they're interacting with each other. And so uh, this is more common. This is the updated version of the parameter server. Um, and this is common in both Horovod and PyTorch distributed data parallel. Um, and this distributed gradient descent uh, version, the all reduce is uh, faster. It's certainly much faster than the parameter server, but it's also incredibly bandwidth intensive. Um, and in fact, as you add more and more and more and more accelerators to this overall job, um, the communication and the bandwidth specifically becomes the upper bound. Um, like you, you become basically uh, you max out your ability just to communicate and then adding extra uh, instances to your job doesn't do anything for you. You're not scaling efficiently. So we built a thing for that. Uh, so SageMaker Distributed Data Parallel uh, provides a custom algorithm for this. So this is a custom communication collective uh, algorithm on AWS uh, that is purpose built for distributed gradient descent. Uh, so this runs on SageMaker. Uh, basically, we use the uh, CPUs on all of your instances to operate like parameter servers. So they're communicating with all of the other CPUs. And then the GPUs or the accelerators um, are used for the majority of the lion's share of the work, right? They're actually doing the forward and the backward pass. Um, the uh, CPUs, again, are communicating uh, with the other instances and passing the gradients. Um, and then we overlap the backward pass with the GPU health checks, basically. So in order to communicate with all of the accelerators, um, we will, uh, yeah, we'll overlap that with the backward pass communication. And it's really fast. It's uh, 20 to 40% faster and therefore less expensive than Nickel. Uh, and other MPI-based solutions on AWS. And so this is how to get the best performance on AWS uh, for extremely large cluster sizes. 
And so data parallel in a nutshell, again, is, uh, is actually making copies of your model. Um, what's going on in a data parallel world is we're making multiple copies of your model on each accelerator. So if you have a box with eight GPUs um, and you have data parallel uh, and your data parallel degree, maybe you're running uh, eight copies of your model, then each GPU is gonna have one copy of the model and we'll split the data across all of those, run forward pass, compute the gradients, run the backward pass, then actually constantly rematerialize the version of the model inside the accelerators. It's crazy, but that's actually faster um, than keeping one global copy as in the parameter server, again, just because of the communication. So that's data parallel. Uh, and then data parallel is great for large data sets. Like when you're working on many hundreds of, honestly, honestly, even more than 50 GB and data parallel will do a lot for you. But even a hundred GB, a couple hundred GB, once you get in the terabytes, um, data parallelism is, is really critical. And it's a way to just speed up your job. So if your training job takes you a couple days, a couple weeks, I know it does for some of you, uh, then data parallelism is a way that you can just speed up your job. You just add more instances to this training job config and use a data parallel distribution software and your job just runs faster. It's a beautiful thing. Works like a charm. <laughs> you just add data parallel to all of your instances and your job just runs faster. It's, it's just pure math and it's wonderful. So data parallelism is great. But data parallelism isn't enough. Uh, so particularly when your large language model doesn't fit on a single GPU or a single accelerator, which is the case for uh, really any model that's north of about 1 billion parameters. So anything in the six, seven billion parameter family and more, uh, you're gonna want to split that over multiple GPUs, multiple accelerators. So there are two ways of thinking about this. One is called pipeline parallelism where we take the layers of your neural network and like literally put the layers of your neural network on different uh, accelerators. So back to our, our handy dandy, uh, handy dandy little demo here. So let's say I've got this uh, GeForce GTX 700, which I do, let's hold it the right way this time. Here we go. Uh, so let's say I've got this handy dandy uh, accelerator and I have two GPUs. In a data parallel world, I might have two copies. I have copy one and copy two. And then I'm running my forward and my backward pass and I'm splitting the data. So half the data sees GPU one, half the data sees GPU two, and I'm averaging the gradients. And so I get one model at the end, uh, which is the exact weighted average of GPU one and GPU two. If you have doubts about this, don't worry the atom optimizer itself is just an averager in any case. So commutative property is great. <laughs> Whether you're averaging across batches or across GPUs, the difference is the same. So that's data parallelism. In a model parallel world, um, my model is too big to fit on a single one of these. So I'm gonna take layer one and then layer two goes over here. So I might have half of my neural network sitting on one accelerator and then I have the other half of my neural network sitting on my second accelerator. So that's pipeline parallelism. Pipeline parallelism takes layer one and layer two and then runs a communication framework. So my data first goes into GPU one, I get my forward pass, then it goes into GPU two, I get my forward pass here, and then I compute the loss and then I do the backward pass on both of those. Um, the second type of parallelism is called tensor parallelism. Tensor parallelism basically goes one layer deeper than that, which is if I have one or however many really large attention heads, let's say I have a, a multi-head attention block that is so large, I need two GPUs. Maybe this whole uh, box here, this whole little card, uh, this set of two cards, this might just be one layer in my neural network, right? If I have a huge gigantic attention head that's parked on two of these, then I'm using tensor parallelism. So just know that there are lots of ways of splitting your model. And one way of splitting your model is called pipeline parallelism. 
and the larger way is called tensor parallelism. So SageMaker Model Parallel is a fully managed distributed training library that you can use to easily partition your own models. Uh, so you can use SageMaker Model Parallel to easily uh, point to, again, PyTorch. Um, and we stabilize the GPU utilization for you, actually. So you don't even have to like grapple with the pipeline and tensor parallelism if you don't want to. We have automatic plugins to find the best uh, partitioning strategy for you. Um, and then we actually interleave the execution path. So um, we'll execute the forward and the backward pass on different accelerators at different points in time to give you a really nice and stable um, GPU or acceler accelerator utilization, um, helping you scale more effectively. Obviously runs nicely on SageMaker, um, and is, uh, yeah, works nicely with PyTorch. So again, SageMaker Model Parallel, to split this visually, um, splits your model over multiple accelerators. So literally, we'll take your mini batch and we'll split your mini batch into micro batches. So uh, if your global batch size is eight um, and your per GPU batch size is two, uh, that would mean your micro batch size is two, right? So micro batch is the same thing as, as a per GPU. And so what's interesting is let's say again, here I have my four GPUs um, and I have one layer per accelerator. So one layer one, layer two, layer three, layer four. And then I'm piping in my data from S3. I can execute these at different points in time. Um, you can use this algorithm and this framework to just easily execute only um, sort of the, the forward or the backward pass at a time that keeps the overall GPU utilization more stable. So this minimizes idle time on the accelerators and is eventually much more cost effective. And then uh, we went and developed something else. So this, this other project from last year um, is called Mix. It's from our Amazon science team who like to minimize the communication scale on the cloud. And in particular, um, this hits a 99% linear scaling efficiency in a jump from 128 to 512 GPUs and is almost three times faster than deep speed because we use something called hierarchical GPU communication. So Mix develops a number of technologies and, and uh, the most impactful one um, is an inter a, a novel GPU communication framework that first communicates inside of data parallel groups and then communicates across data parallel groups. So basically uh, look inside of the model first to communicate and then aggregate across models. This is useful uh, because again, it reduces the total number of communication hops, letting you just be so much faster with your model training. So how do you get started with SageMaker Distributed Training? Uh, we have a lot of example notebooks. So we have example notebooks on GitHub that we're gonna look at in just a minute. Um, you can also just plug into to our distributed training libraries uh, as your backend. So especially SageMaker DDP, um, you can easily point to this from Hugging Face Accelerate, uh, from PyTorch, through a number of other options. And then you can keep all of your same distributed training software and just set SMDDP as your backend and enable it in the job config. Um, and then you don't have to like rewrite all of your code, for example. You can also just add it to your Docker files. So you can use the AWS Deep Learning containers and then add the SageMaker DDP um, or SageMaker Model Parallel, I believe, code to that Docker container, uh, build it and use it. And then, uh, yeah, then you get the performance boosts. And with that, let's take a look at the demo. So in this notebook, we are going to pre-train GPT-2. Uh, that is correct. We're gonna train a 30 billion parameter GPT-2 based model uh, here in this very notebook. Uh, this is gonna be on SageMaker. And if you like, you are welcome to follow along with me. Uh, so for those of you who are familiar with the SageMaker examples, um, this is a notebook from the examples repository. Uh, we're in this handy training directory, in particular inside of distributed training. Uh, so this is, includes some PyTorch uh, and TensorFlow examples, especially in model and data parallel. 
and you'll see we're, we're gonna work on GPT-2. Uh, so feel free to use the QR code if you like uh, to get the link. Otherwise, you can go straight to the bit.ly uh, sm-nb-4. So let's check this thing out here. All right. Uh, so as promised, here is the training GPT-2 notebook. Uh, if you're running this at home, a uh, couple pro tips. First off, as usual in SageMaker Studio, uh, start with the smallest instance you can. Uh, so this uh, T3 medium, uh, should be a handy place to get rolling. And then this notebook is extremely verbose. The training job is going to output so many logs. Uh, it's actually going to kill your kernel if you don't uh, turn off the log. So before you run this, uh, scroll down here to the training job definition. And then where it, where it says uh, SMP estimator dot fit. Uh, feel free to set weight equal false and set logs to false. Uh, this will, uh, so the logs equal to false will certainly stop the logs from emitting. Uh, and then this weight equal false gives you the notebook back actually. So it's not, it's not uh, sitting here idle um, or rather sitting here in use thinking the Python program is running. So let's take it from the top. So this notebook is, uh, as promised, uh, pre-training GPT-2. Uh, so first off, you're thinking, why not GPT-3? Uh, why not something more recent? Um, so as it happens, uh, GPT-3 is a pretty near proxy to GPT-2. Uh, there were very little uh, low-level updates to the model. The biggest update uh, was a 10x increase in size, uh, pretty nearly. And so starting with GPT-2, uh, and then increasing the size of the model is a great place to get started. And in particular, uh, we're using Hugging Face, uh, Transformers, and something called Sharded Data Parallel. So Sharded Data Parallel is a nice framework on AWS uh, that implements a custom communication collective. So this actually overlaps the uh, backward pass of your model with the GPU communication. Uh, to give you this hierarchical GPU communication uh, that is available through the model parallel library. So we're going to learn how to do this here. The notebook comes with all sorts of things. Uh, the entry point here is the train.py uh, script. Um, you also have a data pipeline to uh, run on a much larger data set. So this notebook ships with a tiny subset of data. Uh, it's going to be the SST2 data set, uh, and it is quite small, um, but you can still use it to just get things up and running. And then once you've done that, you're, wel you're welcome to change that out to the uh, much larger data pipeline. That's going to download the web data set, uh, which is uh, multiple hundreds of GBs. So it's a pretty hefty job. And then the learning rate scheduler, feel free to take this, copy this, use it, very helpful. Uh, and then all sorts of other items. So first, as usual, uh, we'll install our SageMaker SDK. All the normal configs here, we're grabbing our execution role, pointing to various things. And then as promised, we're gonna download that SST2 data set. Uh, first installing the transformers uh, data sets and then the transformers library itself. And then importing from data sets couple functions here, load data set, load from disk, load the metric. And then this auto nozzle for causal, for causal LM. So remember causal LM stands for a causal uh, language model. And that refers to the left to right prediction that uh, GPT based models do. So they have that causal language modeling loss. Uh, and then they're going to use that uh, left to right autoregressive behavior uh, to predict new tokens and new words. And so in the notebook, you're going to define some hyperparameters, notably the data set that you're using, the config for this. Uh, remember in Hugging Face, you, you add these extra parameters. Yes, indeed, I do want to train, I do want to eval. And then we'll load the data sets. And then we'll load the tokenizer and do some pre-processing on my humble T3. So we're doing the pre-processing right here using this mapper. All right, and then we're setting these as hyperparameters. 
And then we're putting them back in S3. Uh, so remember your uh, handy command here is always just AWS S3 copy. Uh, so fun thing about notebooks uh, is that the Boto 3 and the AWS CLI library is already set. Uh, so you can always do something like an AWS S3 LS. And then this will just show you what notebooks uh, your, uh, your, or rather what buckets, what S3 buckets uh, your notebook can point to. Uh, and then you can of course copy uh, and you can uh, copy to and copy from all sorts of things. Great, so that's your S3 LS. And then uh, here we're storing these uh, just as variables. Great, so we've got our S3 train location and then our validation data set. Later on in this uh, YouTube series, we're gonna show you how to use FSx for Luster. And so we'll set up FSx for Luster and then actually run this same notebook actually on FSx for Luster. So that's gonna be in the next YouTube video. Um, but this one just focuses on the notebook and letting you understand how to use this notebook appropriately. Yeah, and so with Luster, uh, you have all these other lovely configs uh, you get to set, and we'll, we'll learn how to do that in the next session. And here's some hyperparameters. So our max steps, seed, in fact that we're using BF16. And onward. And then the model config. Uh, so unless you have access to 16, P4D instances in your account right now, then you're gonna wanna pick a smaller uh, GPT-2 config. I do have 16 P4D, so I'm gonna show you uh, myself launching on that just so you can see it, because it's <laughs> really exciting. Um, but if not, uh, then feel free to start with this one. Uh, so most of you should start with the either the GPT-2 XL or the GPT-2 small and then uh, you'll update the um, configs down below and I'll show you how to do that. Great, yeah, so more information. Oh, excellent, okay, so, so remember the world size here, that just refers to the total number of GPUs or accelerators in your overall cluster. Uh, so if you have one P4D, uh, then you have a world size of eight. If you have two P4Ds, uh, you have a world size of 16 and so on and so forth. And so the recommendation here is that for GPT-2 with 30 billion parameters, uh, we're actually saying you need at least 16 uh, P4D instances. And then for GPT-2 XL, um, you're gonna want at least one P4D. And for GPT-2 small, uh, then you can get away with a P3.16 uh, XL. All right, so make any changes that you need to make based on the recommendations up here. I'm gonna leave this at uh, 16 times eight to give us that world size. And then uh, for fun, we'll set the base job name, not necessary, but handy. And then the luster uh, configs that we'll set in the next video. And then here we're gonna create the PyTorch estimator. Um, so this is again, a wrapper around the uh, both the PyTorch deep learning container, which is the base image, uh, and the training job API. Uh, so we're invoking uh, SageMaker train model, create a training job, and then we're passing all of this stuff. Uh, so we're passing the uh, main entry point, so this script here, and then the source directory, um, you can set that to uh, really anywhere referential to this uh, to this object, to this path. Um, we're setting it as the working directory here. And then uh, SageMaker will look inside of the source directory for your entry point. It will also look for a requirements.txt. Then we're gonna pass our instance type, uh, instance count, SageMaker session, and then this bundle of joy here. So the uh, distribution, um, uh, path here. So we're setting our MPI message passing interface. Uh, so that's a sort of base library just to communicate across instances. It, it enables uh, distributed computing generally. And then we're telling MPI, hey, here's how many, um, uh, here's how many processes per host. So eight GPUs 
uh, per instance up there, and then those other custom MPI options that we passed actually just to uh, sort of set the MPI config uh, to work nicely with the SageMaker distributed training framework. And then here are the uh, SM distributed parameters. So again, in this case, we're using model parallel um, because we want to shard the model across multiple GPUs. Uh, and in fact, again, we're using that sharded data parallel framework. And so it's a little confusing, but sharded data parallel is indeed a part of model parallel um, because it's a way to work with large models. And so we're, we're just enabling this. So we say model parallel is enabled. Uh, DDP, so DDP is distributed data parallel. And so we're just telling uh, the job here that we do indeed need to use a data parallel framework. Uh, and so that is useful for having multiple copies of the model in your overall cluster. If you have just one copy of the model, uh, DDP would be set to false. You might be doing that for fine tuning, um, but certainly if you're pre-training on a very large cluster size, uh, then you'll want to uh, set DDP to true. A couple other parameters here. Again, BF16 is a helpful uh, data representation uh, that increases stability in, in pre-training and, and large-scale training. All right, uh, framework version. So uh, we're running on PyTorch 1.13, which obviously you can update this. Uh, so uh, certainly you can use a more recent version of PyTorch. Uh, this is the, the one that we've used for this example. And then you're setting the version of Python here as well. You can also skip this and point to just a base image. So if you have your own deep learning container, your own image that you'd like to use as a base, uh, you're welcome to send that here as well. Then we're going to point to S3 on the output side. So that is where the model will go at the completion of training. And then we're setting checkpoints. Uh, so you can set your checkpoints uh, to either S3 um, or it'll default to FSX for Luster, if Luster is there. And then checkpointing is useful because uh, if and when your job fails, uh, you want to, of course, capture the most recent checkpoint and then restart from that checkpoint in the next version of your job. Uh, so checkpointing is useful. All of this will dive into more detail throughout the rest of the course. And then metric definitions, hyperparameters, so on and so forth. Great, and then uh, we'll call mo uh, estimator.fit, model.fit, and then again, this is spinning up those 16 uh, P4D instances, uh, pointing to my data that's in S3, and then remember, just set logs to false, uh, and then if you like, you can set weight equal to false as well uh, to give you this, this notebook back. And so that lets us do, again, more, more programming. And so now that that's wrapped, uh, let's see if we can check this out. So we'll go back into the uh, SageMaker console and we'll go out here to training and then we'll look at training jobs. So we'll click on training jobs and then lo and behold, uh, we do have a couple jobs completed. And then remember, because this is a small sample um, of the data because this isn't a web scale data set. This is just a, a small demo. Um, the job completes quite quickly, right? Obviously uh, 12, 11 to 12 minutes is, is great. Uh, in the real world, um, if you're actually pre-training a 30 billion parameter model, that's gonna take a solid 30 days, maybe more, uh, very likely maybe 45 days. Uh, and so in any case, uh, 10 minutes isn't bad. And so here we can see the job metadata. This is the name of my job. Indeed, it completed uh, just today. Tiny volume size, uh, which is fine. Um, again, because um, I was checkpointing my model in S3. Um, in other cases, you'll wanna just increase this uh, as a function of the model size actually. Yeah, the volume size, uh, because this will uh, let you store larger and larger models uh, on the instance itself. Um, otherwise, it, you can store it on Luster, um, and then, uh, or you can just save it to S3 directly, in which case the size doesn't matter. And then, yeah, P4D, 
24 Excel times 16. <laughs> so uh, we just pass this to the trainee job. And then again, SageMaker spins up this massive uh, distributed training cluster uh, that lets us train our model uh, quite effectively. So we'll point to uh, our input data config. So we set this train channel and I'll, I'll go back in. Actually, let's just do this now. So the train channel is created through this thing that's called a data channel. And so the data channel is really a way to send data to your model in some capacity. Uh, and so in this case, we passed an S3 path uh, let's see here. So when we when we set the data channel, yeah, which is right here, then let's see if we can just find this. So we'll look for data channel in our notebook here. Yeah, here we go. So that's under the luster config. And then there should be another one, uh, not data channel. Here we go, data channel. There we go. Mm, yeah, so if we're not using Luster, then the data channel is really just a pointer to S3. So this is using this uh, training input, which lets you set other uh, configs for that pointer in S3, or you can just set the path directly. And then it's, it's just this little object here. And so that goes into your training job. And then let's unpack the script briefly. So out here, uh, we'll take a look at the train.py. So that's this one. So this is the main entry point uh, that we set for this model. And it is a long script. Uh, so for those of you who enjoy long scripts, uh, I hope you enjoy this one. Uh, for those of you who don't, uh, feel free to go on to the next video. <laughs> this, this one's gonna be a, be a long script here. So let's let's unpack this. All right, so SM distributed. Uh, so again, those are the SageMaker distributed training libraries, and we're gonna import those into this script. Uh, so we're importing them as SMP. Uh, and so for SageMaker model parallel, you can use that um, sort of as um, distributed training uh, software directly. So you can write new models that interact with SMP using this SMP.step. Um, if you have a different model, like say you have something from Hugging Face Accelerate uh, and you want, or PyTorch fully sharded data parallel, then you can plug into uh, our optimized backends um, just by updating a couple lines of code actually. But this script is gonna use SMP directly. And then we're using obviously PyTorch, Transformers, and then all of those other uh, Python scripts in this package. Right, so data pipeline, learning rates, memory tracker, all of those we're importing right here. All right, SMDDP, uh, a couple objects here, and then let's roll. So the learning rate scheduler, handy thing, make sure you have a learning rate scheduler. Add SMP step. So this add SMP step, this decorator here, uh, what this is doing is parallelizing everything inside of this function, actually. So every time your model takes a step through another mini batch, um, you can add this decorator to uh, distribute that step. So the distribution is mostly useful um, in the forward and backward pass. Uh, in the case of model parallel, um, it's interesting because the different layers in your model are actually gonna be put on different GPUs or different cards. Uh, so you might have layer one on one card and layer two on another card. Um, and then this SMP.step like orchestrates the communication across those cards at the same time as uh, sending the mini batches through. So it's gonna send the mini batches to those cards give you the forward pass, um, and then compute the loss relative to your uh, label data and relative to the weights in those layers. And then it'll backprop that loss to those same layers. And so all of that happens right here. And then basically SageMaker model parallel is handing that distributed orchestration. So we deal with the 
uh, like tracking where the different layers are on the different GPUs and keeping the GPU utilization stable uh, while you just get to write your PyTorch code. So you deal with the PyTorch uh, and then we deal with the uh, sort of distributed orchestration. And so that's the case for the train step and the test step. And then the model evaluation uh, works as well. And then uh, to summarize, because uh, this is actually an introduction to pre-training, um, let's see here. So there's an arg that's called uh, dot fine tune, and that's just in this example um, because the same training script can be used both just to fine tune a GPT-2 model um, or to literally pre-train it from scratch. And I want to show you the difference because it's not that big actually. Uh, so, where's this model config? Great. Uh, so, if args.fineTune, basically, if you are fine tuning, actually, I don't think that's the one. So, basically, if you are fine tuning, then you're going to pick up this model. Here we go. Where is this? Yeah, this is the one. Line 952. So if you are fine tuning this model, then you're going to pick it up from pre-trained. So you'll pick up a pre-trained model, such as one that's sitting on your local EFS volume, uh, in which case you'll point, or your local disk. Uh, so you'll point to args.modelder, which, which will just read that pre-trained model. Um, otherwise, uh, you can download it from the Hugging Face Hub um, using this uh, syntax right here. So just dot from pre-trained and it'll download this model. Uh, if you're not fine tuning and you wanna pre-train because like me, you think it's cool, uh, then you're gonna load from config actually. So literally the biggest difference <laughs> in the training script um, is, is how you're loading the model. Uh, in this case, we're going to load the model from the model config uh, to pre-train this from scratch. Um, I will say the tokenization is different for pre-training than it is for fine-tuning. Um, typically, you'll use slightly different tokens um, because instead of doing, um, say, BERT um, or normal uh, GPT-2 just generation, you need to actually do the masking. Um, or do the CLM. So the tokenization is different, um, but the actual training uh, script is, is literally nearly identical. Uh, and so, so that's how to get started with pre-training. And then let me show you the logs to this job. So uh, here we pointed to our train channel. So again, that's in S3, our test channel, and then the model checkpoints get uploaded to S3 on completion. And remember, so SageMaker training uh, captures all of the hyperparameters for you. It's capturing uh, the number of epochs we go through, the fact that we're using flash attention, uh, the BF16, the number of heads, the number of checkpoints we're storing, the number of layers that we want to save the final model. Yeah, just set that to a one if you do want to save the model, which most of you will want to do. <laughs> And then uh, here we go. So we're going to view the logs. Uh, so when your jobs run for longer, uh, these graphs will be more exciting. Uh, in this case, the jobs ran for uh, just a few steps. So we're barely uh, seeing anything in the charts, which is fine because we're going to view it in the logs. So now we're going to go out to CloudWatch. And in CloudWatch, uh, we're able to see the logs for, of course, all of our AWS resources, uh, and in particular, our SageMaker training jobs. And so this is nice because you can see, yes, indeed, I do have 16 instances. Uh, and so each instance has its own CloudWatch stream. Uh, so here we'll see these, these 16 uh, instances. And then let's start with the top one. So we'll start at the top one, and then I'm going to scroll up here just a bit. What I'm looking for right now, more than anything, is to make sure that I have the right 
alg that I have the right instance actually. So you see it says algo one, algo two, and so on. Um, that actually refers to the, right, the instance is, is just denoted by this algo two. Uh, and all of the non-leader nodes, they'll all point to the primary node. Um, and you'll see which one typically So in any case, they're pointing to the main one, um, which can be algo one. Great. Okay. So they're they're pointing to to the main, um, and then we can go to the top, and we can display. We can view in plain text, which is quite nice. And then you can uh, search for different points in time in CloudWatch. So you can go. Uh, to a custom display, and it's going to look for a moment in time. Um, so you can say uh, an absolute day, for example. So if you ran this job um, in May, then you'll actually like pick the date and the time, and you'll sort of set this window to do the search. Uh, otherwise, you can set it relative to where you are now, and then you go back, and then that uh, will bring the logs up. But if you just run it, it's it's quite easy to see. And so. And these logs here, uh, the first thing uh, your job is going to do is just pip install everything in that requirements.txt. Uh, so it's going to pip install everything in that list. And again, you can avoid that by pre-building a container and then just using the image in your job. Otherwise, you can just put everything in this list here in the requirements. So it downloads it and then we run the job. Oh, one other uh, point to call out here is that, so SageMaker will uh, print the environment variables, actually. Most commonly, it'll print the environment variables, which tells you uh, where all of the resources are and the different environment variables uh, that you were using. And then uh, once you see that, it's, it's a handy way to get sort of oriented uh, with how the framework works. And so with that, uh, I hope you enjoyed this introduction uh, to pre-training your own large models. In the next video, we're going to learn how to set up FSx for Luster and then how to actually train uh, by using FSx for Luster. So we'll check that out in the very next video. Thanks.